Hello and welcome guys. So yeah, we're going to be talking about finishing operations of 3D printed parts by me, Keith Weber, one of the application engineers here at CATI, Computer Aided Technology. I'm based out of the uh, Novi office next to Detroit, Michigan. And yeah, so we're going to start off with, let's meet the team, the equipment I used, and then we will be talking about the hypotheses I had going into these uh, projects I'm about to share with you. Then I'll end with some tips and tricks and things that I learned followed by, you know, if we have extra time or people are interested, I can show you some of my spreadsheets as well. So with that, let's get started. So start off, I am using Stratasys uh, FDM um, equipment. So <clears throat> as most people know, fused deposition modeling, FDM, is kind of like a precise hot glue gun that lays down layer by layer um, on top of each other to create your part. So this is one of the technologies that I'm post-processing. Note the layer lines are the reason why you everyone joined this thing is how do we get rid of them? So we'll be going over um, and getting rid of them later. But I'm using the F370 series with a ASA, well, ASA material in this demo. Next up is, yeah, we are working with some polyjet parts as well. So this one is inkjet base that goes back and forth and builds up layer by layer as a jet uh, material on a build play and it's cured with UV ink. Um, higher resolution, better quality stuff. So um, the equipment that I used on this was the Connex 3 uh, 350 or the Object 350 Connex 3. And then the materials I used were the, the Vero series. Uh, in particular, the Vero Magenta. Um, the Roland CNC machines are also used in this presentation. We use the, over here, the Roland MDX 50 for the presentation. Nope, it's a office safe mill that goes to your office. You can mill jigs, fixtures, and other such items on here. So then the other one is, is I decided to use uh, Diablo tools abrasives because they're readily available in um, any Home Depot. So I use their uh, pack, pre packaged materials, the 80, 80, 150, and 220 grit, along with four packs of sandpaper that I bought individually the 120, 180, 320, and 400 sand net, which was really interesting to use. Um, yeah, so they look like this. And so, here are the hypothesis. So right now, one of the things I was toying with is, okay, human versus machine. If you were part of my other webcast, I went into in-depth application of Roland uh, seeing, seeing the outside of a, of a 3D printed shape and the tolerance thing there. On um, this one, we're going to be focusing, so we'll briefly graze over that, but we'll be focusing more heavily on the machine, machine to machine versus human, where can we add, uh, you know, that human type of sanding? And then, you know, just have all these different technologies kind of bite out. So here's the CNC process. We create a part, create a table um, with all the ideal with all the ideal standards. We put a procedure in place and then we, you know, mill the part. So versus the hand sanding method, we're going to remove the support materials. Then we're going to start with the lowest grit, start sanding in a circular pattern and work our way up, followed by a repeat and yeah you just keep repeating that until you hit your highest grit level um we'll talk about the tips and tricks and the details of this in a little bit so yeah when you're creating your part you have to keep the geometries in mind so simple flat surfaces are great curved surfaces look nice but will be harder to post process holes and inlets will be really tough so one of the other tricks is if you're using a machine i like to say build in a sacrificial tower or a Z touch-off point so you can zero in your uh, parts in the fixture a lot easier than when you, you know, would have to do that normally, especially on this curved surface. You have next to no place to get your highest Z with a, you know, 16th inch of a bit. Just really hard to zero that way. So here's some of the tables that I created just to, you know, collect data. I love collecting data because if you're not collecting data, you're kind of losing that process. So this was for the CNC job. Here are the, uh, you know, some snapshots at the different data and time I was collecting for the hand sanding. So you'll note over here with the square, I was using uh, the time here are in seconds, and then the big squares in the middle are my time estimates that I was finding out. So, yeah, when you're having a square flat surface, two and a half minutes per square inch of a surface, 
was reasonable for me to accomplish with great results versus if I was doing a full dome, you're talking about 10.2 minutes per square inch. There's a huge difference between a complex geometry versus a flat geometry. That's where, yeah, it gets really tough. And then you can see all the in-betweens with like that curved valley surface versus the cylinder with the edges. It the Time changes a lot depending on your geometry. So we have a couple other things for polyjet and whatnot. So we can dive into those spreadsheets and my findings at the end. But just want to touch on that. So here's the procedure for, you know, our hand sanding. We're going to print some parts. I like to do samples of the material first. So six of each plus maybe two more just in case. Um, I was using, yeah, like I said, the F370 at 0 .007 inches. Um, then I separated the parts. So then I had a three-step box versus a four-step box, which that's just the number of grits I'm going to use on the hand sanding process. I took the original me measurements, then I ran, you know, some quick timing on the first two sacrificial pieces to see, all right, how much time do I need per side? Like, you know, um, I'll touch on the exact procedure from our corporate company that they walk through of how do they make some amazing stuff. But um, my goal for this was more of a, how do we get realistic, you know, nice looking parts in your hands with only using stuff you find at, you know, the local Home Depot. Because if you're not a finishing shop, you're not going to be investing a lot of money into a lot of fancy tools to do this. And then, yeah, I set, you know, a realistic timer after I had timed myself. And then, yeah, just sat there for a long time doing it and just having things beep at me. The sales guy next door hated me. With all the, the timers going off every 30 seconds, every 60 seconds, every 90 seconds. It was kind of nauseating for several days. And then, yeah, we can paint the parts at the end. So here is the sample procedure from Stratasys for like the professional parts that you'll see later. So this is the actual like step by step by step by step by step by step by step. By step. And you just keep going. And then this is still, I truncated it as well. So there's some other sub parts, but yeah, this is just a general idea of how many times you have to go back and forth between steps if you wanted to get in the like the high-end parts. And I'll show you what those look like too, so then you can make your call. So this was my setup. I did it at my desk. Here are my sample pieces. Very simple, easy to do, um, you know, for this kind of webinar, but just to really give you an idea of the different samples. So you can tell I marked all the backs so we know the CNCs versus the originals versus, you know, the three stage and four stage and just set it up and had my timer in the background over here. And yeah, it was just quite fun. So here's our, you know, CNC, which was part of another webcast. So I'll just kind of brush over this a little bit. Now we printed the parts, we separated them. We uh, soaked some and then took measurements against them to see if they changed. Surprisingly, they actually didn't once they were fully dry. We created the, the jig. Then we uh, milled the part and we got some re nice results. And then here's some of our, like the ones that I did specifically for here, milled in a different jig, but similar structure. And then, you know, took some measurements. Okay. Yeah. So now let's go into the tips and tricks of what I learned from it. Um, so the jigs, we like weird jig shapes really help for it to stick into your uh, phone. I like using a 90 pound phone personally. It, uh, very, I'll say, cost-effective. It's lightweight. It's really fast to mill, and then it, when it wears out, you can toss it and build a new one, and you're not really attached to it. So, I really enjoyed that. Um, having um, a one to two percent draft angle really made those putting the parts on a lot easier than when it was straight. Um, the other part was over here was having a key slot that we built in, so that when you put parts in, it always goes in straight because you don't want to mill something uh, 90 degrees off or something off that just kind of really you can break some bits that way so it's safe and then also putting air pockets on the side so when you're picking it up it doesn't create that vacuum because these are porous foam so it will kind of hold on to it like a vacuum form um yeah then here's some of the next gen where added some more air pockets and add the air pockets out so that you can actually get under the part and pry it up with uh you know, a little jig fitcher or a, uh, you know, screwdriver. So, yep, there's those. Those are my little air pockets. And then this center circle isn't actually for an air pocket. It's the zeroing for my uh, mill. So I'm able to drop the bit right into that circle and then touch off from the bottom so that now I have zeroed that uh, jig in so I can go from jig to jig without worrying about losing tolerances. 
So yeah, some of the failures, uh, not putting down enough sticky tape or securing the foam block and it kind of tossed it. Um, this jig, the, uh, was it, this one was like a three or 4% draft. So the part wasn't held in right. So it picked it up and threw, threw it through the wall. So even though it looks good, that was kind of a fail. Um, yeah, more sticky tape and yeah, the broken part over there. So then yeah, here's the zeroing. So before you have to really kind of look into the machine. There's a safety glass that you have to see through. So that's how you're seeing this picture. And it's really hard to see into this, uh, you know, is it touching, is it not? So one of the tricks was is, all right, if you put a uh, post-it note down on top of it and you let it lay, like it's supposed to be perfectly flat. So you can see kind of hard to see in the picture, but it's perfect flat over here and then curves down. So then when you touch it, you'll see a slight flex. It's a lot easier to, you know, see if it touches. Here's some more of those sacrificial little towers on the uh, parts. So for touch-offs, so that you can zero in your part in the jig a lot easier. They're they're going to be sanded off or milled off anyway. So, and they don't they add next to no time into the print. You're talking seconds, and they save a lot of time in zeroing. And yeah, here's that picture from earlier. And then one of the other issues that kind of came up. So this um, phenomenon, I'll call it where if you look at the, let's see, do I have, yeah, there we go. So these wavy lines and kind of get air gaps in it, this is called twinning. And it has something to do with your, um, what's it called, your XY calibration and your touch offs in your printer. So this is one of the main reasons why we are going to post-process stuff. We find that you can actually fix this going into like insight and changing your air gaps and going into the fine details and fine tuning your machine so that it looks better. So that's one method, but here's another example where the twinning is not nearly as bad, but you can still kind of see those air gaps. From a distance, you won't be able to see it, but you know, we're striving for perfection here. So here's you know a now a more calibrated uh, machine. As you can see, still a little bit, little dots here and there, but still a much closer, next no air gaps. We're getting better. So there, you know, these are like the ideal situations. So this is also the raw stock for our post processor. Um, one of the other tricks is instead of sanding, we can actually go into the spray paint method, which is a very interesting one that I was told about. Most people know, you know, grab a coverage, spray it afterwards. So one of the future, I'll say webinars and or uh, I think it's going to be more of a blog post that I'm working on with another AE is we're actually going to run through this kind of gauntlet of just post processing without machining or labor. So his theory is that his method's better. I say my sanding results are pretty darn good, and we'll we'll see who's better um, in the in the near future. But his theory says that you start off with the lacquer, so it's a higher um, solution, so it absorbs into the part faster, and it dries really quick, but it doesn't have the coverage. So he starts off with lacquer, then he jumps over to either if it's a uh, FDM part. He'll jump over to the two or to the the triple thick glaze to fill in those those lines with the clear coat so it looks nice and flat. Or if it's a polyjet part, he may even just hit it with the um, you know the clear coat to just even out some of those layer lines. And then one of the other things that he was working with is after sanding using this uh, polish, this wax for um, uh, floors, and he had some great results with that, along with some polishing compound for your car. Um, for polishing up the uh, uh, polyjet parts. So this is a kind of a sneak peek into one of the future in-depth things we'll be doing. So keep that in back mind. I've also touched with some of this. So here's what we started off with. Some nice high quality shots. You see, you know, some nice lines. You can see the little, I don't know, fibers from my mouse pad. But yeah, we got some, like you have to really look hard to get all these layer lines. But say we don't like them. So we sanded them. And then this is a better shot. So this is 30 seconds on the lowest grit, 80. So you saw, all right, got rid of most of the line. It's pretty scratched up. It's matte now. Here's stage two, a little bit closer. All right, I think it looks better. It's just it's really close. Now some scratches. Stage three. Now we're getting into this really nice, like it's like it's flat. You don't see any of like most of the scratches are gone. It's looking really good. Then stage four. Yeah, that picture didn't fire. Uh, um, we'll see some more later on. So once you get that, here is the original versus the post-process. 
As you can see, three stages, looks matte, it's not too bad. Here's four versus four. Mm, can you see it? Not much. Now here's a four on one side um, that's been, da -da -da, yeah, that's been the polish with just sandpaper, and then one that's been clear coated. The other trick is when you're clear coating, you have to have a really clean room. Like we have a nice lab in the back, but we're still getting particulate on our prints for whatever reason. So like you have to have a really, really clean like paint booth designated area that doesn't have people walking in and out and stuff because you're going to get stuff stuck in your paint. So that's another thing. When you have finishing, you're going to have to have a dedicated area for your spray painting and post-processing because any dust will get on it. And then, yeah, here's another angle up. So now you can see, all right, this is the gloss versus the, um, you know, sanded. See, on one of them with just the 30 seconds plus 30 seconds plus 30 seconds, we missed a little bit of the lines, but, like, it's, it's nice and flat. It looks like a solid sheet of plastic. Um, let's see, this one's covered. Yeah, this is three versus three. And, yeah, so this is a matte paint versus just the a matte paint on four or on three sandings versus the regular three sandings. And the matte paint just kind of absorbs in and doesn't change the appearance too much. So that was just, it got rid of some of the scratches, but you couldn't exactly tell. Like this one still had a little bit more shine than the matte. Like it just absorbed it. It was a really weird um, experience where, yeah, the matte paint wasn't sure if it was actually painting. Um, yeah, so here's some more shots of seeing matte versus not. And then, yeah, here's some of the differences between the three, the four, and the original. As you can tell, like, you know, layer lines are gone. This, a little bit more curved because, you know, sanding isn't perfect. So you will be changing the geometry, so you're going to need to, you know, really pay attention and add that into your design so you have some sacrificial room to post-process these layers off. Um, yeah, so here's some nice, all right, here's the glossy paints. So threes are on top, fours are on bottom, or threes are on this side, and then glossy on the left, and then um, matte, I believe. No, oh, I think it's reversed. So here are the two glossies, and here are the two mattes, and then these are the threes. So note, the three isn't nearly as shiny as the shiny four, so when you do the three, the gloss actually absorbs into those deeper grooves, and doesn't show off as much shine as the uh, four. So putting in that like sanding net really helped. Um, now let's get into the poly jet. So here's a glossy end part. No, these are what's it, 20 or yeah, 24, 16 micron layer line. So it looks really great glossy. But a lot of the times you have to print with support material. And when you put the support material on the part, it comes out looking like this. So not nearly as shiny and awesome as it looks. So how do we get it there? So this one on the far left is matte. Middle is after three sandings with the three different grits and the four sandings. And then this is the glossy. So you can see kind of the transition as you put more time into the sanding, it becomes more and more polished. And then, yeah, here's some nice close-ups. So you can really see, yeah, those gouges on the three, like they still show up on the polyjet a lot more than they do on the FDM. So FDM, you can get away with just a three grit system, quick, down, dirty, easy. But yeah, putting in that fourth 400 grit or better really makes PolyJet shine. So then, yeah, so here's the matte versus the three stage versus the um, matte paint on a three. So as you can tell, like, it's kind of cool. It makes it look kind of like a leather pattern if you're doing that spiral circle um, random orbital type deal. So I really like using that and then adding, you know, like a matte painting on it because then it, it makes kind of like a leather. Now here's a glossy of the three stage. So glossy has a lot of, you know, scratches in it, but the gloss fills it out, but then it really kind of shows it. It's like, eh. And then here's the pure gl glossy part on the far right. As you can tell, like, all right, is the time worth it? That's what you should be really you know, going over your head. All right, it's an extra three minutes per square inch on the outside surface. Do we want it to look like this? So then, yeah, here's a matte, matte four, matte paper on four. So, and you can tell the texture of the four is just so much finer and like, it's almost like the surface of a pond. Very small, like it's not, not nearly as like leathery texture as the th 
three. Then here's with the gloss. Like, you can see, I missed a couple scratches down here, but like, it's it's really nice, and it looks, in my opinion, better than the uh, you know the glossy right off the print because it doesn't have those straight line, the wavy layer lines on it. And then yeah, so here's the matte versus the un unprocessed matte, just scraped support material versus the unprocessed glossy. And now we have you know some more a little bit three matte versus you know the unfinished matte. And then four versus unfinished matte. Like you can really tell when you get down onto the surface, if you're trying to sell something in marketing or post process, like it really helps to post process these parts. So now that huge long system that I mentioned before, that's polishing when you go past 400 into the 600, 800, 1000, 1500 grit. This is the type of stuff you can accomplish with those. So like it is, you know, very impressive with the J750 with the colors and just being able to polish these things into these outstanding things. So it's like if you're doing the high end, high visibility parts, I highly recommend going into the higher grits. But if you're down and dirty into the uh, you know FDM world that just needs to be you know representative of an injection mold, you can get away with the three the three part uh, you know or the three step process. Um, you don't need the eight step process. No. Like the difference between the three and the four step of a hard geometry, it's like you're talking about two minutes per square inch versus a 12 or 11 minutes per square inch. Then if you want to double that into the different grits, now you're talking about 20 something, 30 minutes per square inch to get these geometries done, to polish like this. So you'll, it's a judgment call on your part on how well you want these things to look. <laughs> um, yeah, so. Here's some of the, we'll get into dyeing. So if you're using the Agilus 30 system or the digital ABS, you can use some uh, fast stick dye and soak the parts to get these really vibrant reds and oranges. You just, depends on your mixture of content. And yeah, so these were dyed um, quickly or shortly. These are all Agilus. And then this one's the digital ABS on the left. Um, but Here's a sneak peek. We do have vivids already out there. The cyan, or yeah, cyan and magenta, or cyan is coming um, in the near future to join these other two. So the vivid colors on uh, printing on the printer are coming. So dyeing is becoming less and less, you know, needed. It's really hard. There's a lot of timing involved, and it's getting kind of pushed out because now with the vivid line, you can achieve the colors that dyeing used to be able to achieve straight out of the printer. So then, yeah, here's some of the CNC results that I mentioned. I'll just kind of place through. So we started, we did a profile, we created a nice smooth surface. And then, you know, left is before, after, just so you can see, you know, the differences. Before, after, before, after. These are some of my notes for it. So, yeah, if you're doing a square three-step process, you know, 30 seconds, 35, and 40 seconds on the final step, you can expect, you know, I was averaging almost two minutes per square inch versus a dome was about seven inches per square inch. So tighter rounded edges, you definitely go slower. And then um, the four step is, you know, it goes up a little bit, two and a half minutes to 10. And then on polyjet, now you're talking, you know, I only did squares because doing it on polyjet was just so, I was up in the 20 minutes, 30 minutes. I just didn't have time to finish it out. So that will be shared later. And yeah, so that's, everything on my end if there's no questions i'll let bob kind of uh wrap us up okay well keith thank you for spending some time with us this morning um no i know um i'm going to probably use some of those techniques actually this weekend and next week because i'm 3d printing some of my kids halloween costumes and i need to do some finishing so i'll be doing some interesting work there so my my daughter is going as as hella this year from from Thor Ragnarok. So I got a, I got a serious helmet to print. So I'll probably be using some of the, some of those techniques. But um, I want to thank everyone for for attending this morning. Um, this is really some good information. Um, it just shows that there's lots of different things that you can do with the with the parts directly off the machine, but you can take them the next step and continue to do things and get a finished model after that. So 
Keith, thank you very much for your time. Look forward to having you on another webcast with us. Everyone else, thank you very much for your time as well. 